So I want to talk about one of those things that doesn't get talk and talked to about a lot at a lot of security conferences, and that is talking. Uh, my background is basic network route switch, uh, then I got into healthcare, then I got into hacking, then I, now I do cloud stuff, and I, I talk a lot. Uh, you'll, you've seen me talking a lot already. But talking hacker, talking tech, uh, doesn't translate well to talking business very often. So in true B-Science and Hacker Conference uh, uh, style, I'm going to tell you about some of the ways I have utterly failed so that you can learn from that and do better as you work on your careers, as you work on helping clients or maybe your own company, uh, so that you can be better than I have ever been and do much cooler stuff and touch a day I will never see. So this is how we talk. Who here has not said that phrase? Come on, pwn the noobs. I have had to explain the three letter pwn to so many people. Like, that's not funny. Why did you say that? Why are you using that phrase? This is not how normal people think. One of the best compliments I ever got back in my hospital career was the risk management lady saying, you think like a criminal. She wasn't meaning it as a compliment, but I took it as one uh, because I knew that hacking and, and that was what I wanted to get into. Uh, what we really want to remember is that nobody cares that we can pwn motives, noobs. Nobody cares that we got DA. Nobody cares that you did the cool elite zero day hack. Nobody on the business side has any idea what that means. And so it doesn't matter. Just like who here loves hearing profit and loss statements? <laughs> who here likes to hear about hiring strategies? Uh, market uh, attack planning and estimates of potential client success. Yeah, those are really boring phrases I've had to learn in the last six weeks because uh, I'm writing business plans now. That was not a career goal uh, when I got started. So what I want to bring to you is the idea that, yes, we have, to do, uh, we have to do what we do. We have to attack. We have to cause these issues to come to light. But we need to make sure that we're communicating it in a way that people believe it. And yes, Ernie, this is a jab at you, and you're not even looking at me, and I'm hurting. That's OK, because you're the one that said, oh, Star Wars, Star Trek, they're both the same. No. So a little bit about me, again, I already said, I started in tech, I got into HIPAA, I literally went to so many meetings that my name was on the forms for all the HIPAA stuff, and I realized that meant, especially in 2009, when high tech came out, that it was my butt on the line, and it's like, oh, I better learn how these hackers think. I took a great class by a great company based out of St. Louis uh, that also put on a great conference, and I started learning basically how easy this was. <laughs> The hacking stuff, it really shouldn't have been. Uh, so I got burned out dealing with clients and I uh, transitioned into like seam work and doing uh, uh, business planning and cloud stuff. So I've done a lot, I can tell a lot of really weird stories. They're best served over beers. So hit me up later and then I can talk when I'm not on video and I have even better stories. But there are some stories I can share with you of my utter and complete failures. And this is probably my favorite one. Who here, this is your first B-sides? Yes, like two thirds of the room. Uh, who here went to B-sides Kansas City a couple months ago? Who was in my talk for that? You've heard this story, but I'm gonna tell it a little different. And I'm sorry for those B-sides KC people, but this is literally my very favorite story. Early in my pen testing career, uh, again, I was a network route switch guy. Uh, so I didn't know web app pen testing very well. I learned you start Burp Suite, and you watch uh, the traffic, and if there's little blue parts, you can manipulate those numbers, and sometimes, very, very rarely, that means you can cause problems on the website. So we got handed a contract, and it was a web app, uh, it was a cloud 
uh, infrastructure as a service company, and they were like, just put it all in our cloud. We will take care of everything for you. It's 100% uptime guaranteed. It's secure. It's awesome. And they already had clients in it, and then they went, we really ought to get it tested. So you know the story's where it's going, right? Uh, I took a look at it and, you know, okay, yeah, web, cloud thing. It took them a while to set up and provision my access. I start up Burp Suite and I get to my, my servers and I'm like, wait a second, little blue squiggly line here says customer ID equals 20. Huh. Wonder what happens when I put in one or zero. I can't remember which one it was. I had access to their entire cloud infrastructure by changing one parameter in a burp suite request. Those of you who are doing the CTF right now over in the other room, that's like the second question is how to do that. So I literally run screaming from my desk to my boss, Dave, 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 you won't believe what I just did. He tells the story even funnier because he makes my voice sound higher. Uh, <laughs> but I did, little girl screaming, absolutely. Uh, little boy, whichever way you want to go with it. And he, we verify it. Yup, we can take over the whole cloud, so we make a new user, a uh, new admin for the cloud, Hal Jordan. And then he made me make a Han Solo because he didn't want to use Hal Jordan. And, uh, and we call up the client, we're like, uh, guys, this is bad. This is really, 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 really bad. Client says, well, let's get the engineers in the room, let's get everybody, stakeholders in the room, let's go to the big boardroom at this place at this time. But, okay. At that point, I had been in, on very few boardroom talks. So I had to put on my, oh, we're going to the client suit of a polo and slacks instead of green lantern shirt and jeans. And we go in and Dave's like, well, explain what you found. And I, I did the verbal equivalent of pointing at a dumpster fire uh, uh, sign. And the developer says, so what? And we're all going, what? I can burn down your infrastructure. I can create users named Hal Jordan. And my boss was like, you should be ashamed of that. Uh, I can do anything to your environment that I want to. But that didn't matter to the developer. That didn't even matter to the C-level. I explained it in hacker terms. I got DA. I got your cloud. I got your admin. I got everything. And they're like, OK. So my boss at the time had to translate into business Okay, so all your clients, we can delete all their data. So they leave. All your uptime guarantees that you're going to pay out on if you're not up, yeah, we can make you pay out and take you down. All your various numbers that you're tracking on what you do and how successful you are, that whole profit and loss statement, we can tank. Now, sadly, unfortunately, the business owner was not that good at business owner things, so he still was saying so. And this eventually became a court case, and that's why I can talk about the story. Uh, it's a matter of public record. So, yeah, I gave them good info from my frame of reference, but I didn't give them good business info. I didn't make it make sense to, to where it hurt them. Uh, and I've especially learned since then you, you, to make it so that non-techies can grok, which is a so techy word. Uh, <laughs> so don't use that one with business people either half the time. It's got to be in monetary form. If you can't explain how what you did causes profit sinking, shut your mouth. Just don't even bother. Let somebody else do that talking. Uh, the problem is, who here wants to do that kind of talking? Exactly. No hands went up. Uh, nobody really wants to jump that, I'm a cool hacker, to I'm a business leader that can talk about spreadsheets at MBA. Uh, but... We would probably have a way better impact on the world if we did. So I've bitten the bullet, and I'm probably going to be learning a lot of that stuff. <sighs> May deity have mercy on my soul. So, uh, yeah. Some other things and some bad ways that I've communicated. Uh, have you ever been in the shop where, where this is what gets thrown around in Slack, you know, before there was Slack, where everybody's just like, I hate my job. I hate Monday through Friday, not just Monday. I hate being on call. I hate dealing with users. I hate dealing with management. I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate, I hate. And you take all that hate and you stick it inside and it eventually becomes a tumor. And, you know, that's just the environment you're in. 
Yeah, so I was there about a year and a half ago, literally at that place. I swear to God, the name should have been Hate. Um, everybody in a couple hundred man IT department. How many of you guys have hundred, several hundred people in your IT department? Yeah, all of them would say they're overworked. I have about a 20 man IT support department right now. And while there are still some guys who are like, oh, I'm always overworked. Like, I saw your links in Lowell's channel in Slack, dude. I know you're not overworked. <sighs> There's a difference between everybody feeling they're overworked and actually being overworked and being inefficient about it, having inefficient processes. So I was in this place. I'm too busy. Meanwhile, my job, what they would ask me to do, I could get done in about a half hour a day, maybe. I would take my phone with me because the internet egress web filters were really well locked down, really secure company. So I'd bring my phone with me and play on Facebook, play Mahjong, Clan of Clans, whatever. I had to start bringing my battery in to charge my phone halfway through the day so that I could play in the afternoon on my phone. And I bring this up to my boss because, you know, being bored sucks. I know it's not something very many IT people ever have to deal with, and I thought I never would. But it sucked. My, I would come home and just be like so drained from being bored. And my wife notices this and just like, this job is really unhealthy for you. And like compared to, you know, jet setting and drinking every day and doing, you know, like all this, she's like, this is worse. You on a hacker conference bender is not good, but this is worse. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I bring it out to my boss. I'm like, can I do something else too? Can I, you know, you know I have these other skills. Can I, you know, pseudo join this team? Can I do this? Can I put this in place? No, no, we can't do that. We've got very strict delineated roles and uh, for least permissive, and he starts saying all these security words. I'm like, that's not really what that means. Wait, wait a second. You just don't want too many people to have too, I mean like you have some good reasons, but for the most part, you like having everybody pissed. Like that was their management style. And I'm just like, oh, this is not gonna work guys. How can we measure what we're actually doing? So I had a very small group of core guys that I worked with on a very specific team that I will not name because some of them might watch this video later. Um, and we said, hey, we could start tracking this and how much it's actually taking us to do and the effect on the company. And then I ended up also getting to do a phishing exercise, which was great because I, ne I needed that hit in the arm from leaving hacking and not being able to do phishing exercises. I needed another hit of the ha ha tricked you uh, drug. So I got to set it up, but I set it up so that hopefully I would look good or bad, depending on how it worked out, of, yeah, we caught the hacking uh, that happened inside. Well, we didn't, because that security team, they really weren't doing what they were saying and complaining about being so busy doing. So we ended up having the numbers to show, yeah, we've got 500 IT, 200 IT guys, however many, but this is the amount of good it's doing us. And that's the kind of thing where everybody thinks they're going to have the Bob's conversation. What would you say you do here? Uh, and they start worried about getting fired. But what we also figured out was, dude, let's, let's force multiply here. Let's change some things around so that less people doing less work equals more productivity for what we're actually trying to do, rather than everybody grumbling. And once you had it measured properly, measured work, and people could see that yeah, you're busy, but your busy equals this awesomeness for the company. There was less grumbling. There was less, uh, you know, I won't say violence because there was still a lot of, I don't like that guy in accounting and all this, but there were less, less interpersonal conflicts. So, and, and here's the thing. I don't have a, the other story I can tell you specific things, make sure you tie it to profit and loss. This, I, this takes a lot of extra work to figure out how to do this for you. Uh, anybody DevOps fans, Phoenix Project? A few hands? Okay. The three ways and the four types of work. That's where you get started. Now, I'm not in a DevOps shop. I don't know if I could survive in a DevOps shop. But that, to me, is where you have to start figuring out, okay, what is work? When bad things happen, is that work? Is it unnecessary work? Are changes work? Are planning work? All this kind of stuff. So I have no, this is how you do it. No secret sauce for this. 
but I'll tell you, Phoenix Project is what got me to that point of figuring out, okay, this is what is work to me, and this is what I need to communicate it better. My boss right now, uh, he is very fond of, hey, dude, this is what I tested, and these are the vulnerabilities that are no longer vulnerabilities on our system. He doesn't care about, oh, I ran this scan and I could have done this. No, I'm like, oh, we're not vulnerable to that anymore? Yay. That's what he wanted to hear. Uh, uh, not Petya. Petya, anybody have horrible, horrible days from that the other day? I didn't because I read the advisory in March. I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad. Are we patched? Are we going to test? Yeah, okay, we had this many systems that were vulnerable. Now we have none of them internet facing. And they're segmented into this network, so if somebody gets an email, we're good. And I presented that. And everybody's like, okay, yep, another vulnerability, we're, we're good. My CFO still didn't understand what we had done. But he went to a CFO gathering, and yeah, I'm thinking, God, how boring is that? <laughs> he liked it, apparently, because what happened was his, his peers were, were bitching about Petya or, and WannaCry. Or I think WannaCry more than Petya. And he was just like, I didn't hear you guys telling me that this was going to be a problem. I'm like, yeah, I fixed that. And, and basically, he was like, oh, I can tell all my peers that I didn't have any of those issues because I got an awesome security guy. I'm like, yes, especially if you say awesome security guy, <laughs> Ben, Green Lantern shirt. Uh, but no, I mean, I, it still wasn't real just giving him those kind of hackery numbers of the vulnerabilities. But as soon as he could translate it into CFO speak, I don't have the same problems as everybody else, so I can focus on my profit and loss statements. He was happy. I still don't know how to talk to Scott's his name properly, and I hope he sees this video so that he knows that, but maybe someday we'll have some shred of common thing, other than we both want to do better for the company. How long am I talking till? 12.30? Okay, we should be good. So this is, I have to uh, uh, cite my sources. This is a borrowed sales story. This is not my sales story. But I've been telling it enough, I can make it sound like my sales story, but I'll tell you the source when we're done. Not that slide. Uh, communicating is nice and all when it's one direction and it's just, this is what I did. That's, I feel like IT people can learn. We're used to just telling people things and knowledge, dumping, move, and, and doing all that. It gets a lot harder when it's a two-way communication. When you actually have to have a conversation with somebody and listen, because who here is great at listening? Yeah, me neither. Uh, that really gets complicated. So the story goes that a new sales director is hired that has had a vast, vastly exponentially awesome career of taking sales departments that are flailing and not bringing in money. What I learned uh, not too long ago is every salesperson has to support like 10 other employees with what they bring in. And in this organization, the salespeople were doing so badly that they weren't supporting their own salary, much less 10 other salaries. So they bring a new sales director in. And she says, this is how we're going to do things. We're going to change compensation so it goes this way. We're going to make sure that we're focusing on these markets and these products. And it'll be awesome. Go. And the salespeople, generally speaking, just like us, if you change your compensation plan, there will be grumbling. <laughs> I'm being, I, I used to do my job one way and get paid one way. Now I'm doing my job the same way and getting paid less because I didn't listen. Urgh. Grumble, grumble, frazzle, frazzle, whatever. So sales department does not turn around. A few people leave and everybody's like, uh, this is scary. This is not, I don't feel like I'm working in a good environment anymore. So luckily, one of the salespeople happens to know a consultant and brings this up because consultants solve everything, right? You guys know that. Like you can say one, the thing that needs to happen in your organization, but for it to actually happen, you need to call somebody out, pay them three times as much per hour for them to say the same thing and then change happens in your organization. There's actually a, 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 a mental reason for that. People listen, when you go out and pay somebody specifically to say something, they're more likely to listen to it. That's like a known thing and why consulting can be quite nice. When I was doing pen testing, I would go to the IT guy as long as I knew he was okay and just be like, 
what have you been telling them to fix for five years? Oh yeah, that's what I found too. Let's go talk about that. And then they were immediately like, holy, and then I would put it in my report. Things would happen and change. They'd get budget. And they're like, how do you work this magic? I'm like they paid me specifically to tell them what to do. They pay you to do what they tell you to do. You just got to flip the script a little bit. <laughs> no, seriously, that worked on way too many pen tests. Uh, which was really fun when it was a social engineering thing and they weren't supposed to tell me where the problems were. Side the point. So in this sales story, the consultant says, uh, did you bring these concerns to the sales director? Do they know you're having issues? Well, no, I'll get fired. I can't say my mind, I can't speak my mind to my boss. Are you kidding me? Who's been in that thought? Uh, I've, uh, and yeah, so there's nods, there's hand, there's people, I don't know if I want to say it because I might get fired because they're watching through a webcam. Uh, but here's the thing, and I've seen this on the consulting side, but again, this isn't my story. The consultant, consultant was luckily working for the company, goes to the sales director and says, your people are grumbling and they're worried that they're all gonna get fired because numbers aren't doing what you said they were doing. The sales director says, no, that's the point. That's the plan. They, this had to happen so that we could rebound and jump back up. That's the whole plan. I've done this 10 times at 10 other companies. That's how I'm successful. And the consultant to the sales director is, do they know that? And business director, sales director, person, lady goes, well, that's if they didn't understand the why of what I'm trying to do, they would ask, right? They would speak their mind and tell me, right? And the consultant goes, well, depends on how you've worked relationships in the past. And you're new. These people don't know you. They don't know to ask you and be honest and ask for whys. How often have you understood what your boss was trying to do when they bought a new technology? You knew why they were buying it. How often is it, hey, we're buying this cool technology, implement it. Did you ask why? Did the boss have a why? Are all our bosses pointy-haired leaders that have no idea why they do what? Most of us will begrudgingly and not happily say, no, they're probably not idiots. They just happen to look like idiots and they should listen to me more. But why? You have to build that two-way street of communication of trust before you get to that why point. That's also in the uh, Phoenix book, Phoenix Project book that I mentioned. But I actually learned that, and I couldn't get a picture because the, the Amazon uh, logo of it, of the book, was way too small. So if you write nothing else down during this talk, write down this book. Extreme Ownership by Jacko, J-A-C-K-O. He's a Navy SEAL instructor. And he has, this Extreme Ownership book is a story of how he turned around, I don't remember what city it was in uh, Iraq. And how, what he had to learn to own the situation and change it for better and lead his men. And so I like to think I'm okay at leading because nobody's told me I'm not. Uh, the people that I've had to manage and deal with. But there's a big difference between, hey, I need you to work a little bit late and finish this project, and I need you to go out there and get shot at. So I kind of take his lessons a little more useful than mine, probably. His experience is probably worth more than mine. Uh, so when he says the way you start these conversations is you have to be the one to take extreme ownership and ask your bosses, why are we doing this? You have to start that communication and build that trust so that they know that you're a person who will bring up issues. And here's the caveat, the lesson learned, you have to have a solution. If I'm gonna take your questions of why I'm doing something as the leader, you better have another option for me to entertain. If all you're doing is complaining and bitching, I'm not gonna listen as much. That's not useful, that's not productive, that doesn't get us anywhere. But when you say, hey, we did it this way because, and I thought if we changed it that way, it would do X, then you've actually given a possible solution that may be better or worse, you've started a dialogue and you can communicate on that. Has anybody heard some of these, see, I was gonna put a picture there. Uh, has anybody heard some of these concepts before in social engineering? 
So that's what I did for a while at Parameter, and it was so much fun, like walk into a place because I look like the IT guy, and just be like, hey, I'm going to fix a copier. And they're like, yeah, go, and I'm owning everything. It was great. Uh, I started learning social engineering and psychology because I wanted to be better at that, and what I found is it has far more uh, uh, massive effects outside of just walking into a building with a balloon and uh, taking over a network. It's taught me that we can do so much more to massage our message as tech people if we have that foundation of there's a reason for doing it. If you're just doing it to mess with and manipulate people, that's fun and all. Don't get me wrong. I may or may not do that just to keep in practice. But if you're doing it to make your business better, your team look better, your people feel better, that's not just social engineering, man. That's leading. That's showing them this is the direction we're going to go into. I'm going to show you how to do it. Just help. And when you provide that demonstration, rather than telling people, go take that hill, you're not just managing. You're not just the tech guy. You're the tech guy who knows how to talk to people. And I can say from personal experience, that's exactly what a lot of companies are looking for. Uh, I, I highly recommend you pick it up. Now, some people, that is no interest for them at all. I want to be buried in code 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Don't take me outside. Don't put me in front of clients. Nothing wrong with that. But if you are at all interested in someday doing something that doesn't involve lines of code and all of that, start picking up social engineering. Pick up those two books. Start figuring out how the people around you think and translate things to their language. So hopefully what you've learned is that I have utterly failed at my job several times and not gotten fired, which is a useful lesson by itself. Nice work. My family is really glad for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, three boys that eat a ton specifically, very happy for that. Uh, hopefully you have learned that yes, businesses as bad as you may have it at your business, there is worse out there, the first story. Uh, that no matter how bad you may have it with dealing with work, there are people who feel like they have it worse. Second story. Uh, the third story, there's a really good book to read because that story, I'm still working on it. But hopefully you've learned that there's more to being a good hacker, good IT person, good business person than just popping O-Days. Because O-Days, if you look at the right product, are so easy to find. Uh, and, and some of them are really hard to find and we need Travis Romandi for those things. Uh, but what I really want you to get out of this is you can take control of your communication. You can do more and do better and really cause some awesome positive change. So like Beth said, I happen to help out with this really awesome conference in St. Louis. I'd love for everybody who's got three hours drive time to come up September 9th. Uh, tickets are still open. Uh, CFP is closed. Again, hopefully people know who's going to be speaking here fairly soon, but I'm sure I'll get some people that can't make it for whatever reason. I got to adjust the schedule. It always happens. If you'd like to hear me ramble more in a text-based form, I'm on Twitter. Um, and hopefully you can come out there. So any questions? I've got 10 minutes, it looks like. And I can talk about other things if there are no questions. So I always build that in. Anybody know imposter syndrome and Donner Cunning, all that? Yeah, the more you know, the more you think you don't know. Remember this. Uh, it's not that you don't know a lot that everybody else knows. It's that you know a lot that a lot of people also don't know all of it that you know. So it helps me sleep at night. Questions? I will stare at you awkwardly. I'm not going to let you off easy. What was the second book you said? The second book that I said was Extreme Ownership. Uh, the first one was The Phoenix Project. Uh, both of the, has everybody read The Cuckoo's Egg? That's like the one everybody needs to read. Cuckoo's Egg. Phoenix, okay. So a book that you also need to know about hacking and, and just kind of the story of how things work, The Cuckoo's Egg. Um, I'm always, it, you never know what everybody else doesn't know. See? Um, so yeah. And, and I, seriously, I'll put out book recommendations and fill up Twitter for the next three days. Uh, I, I really like to read. The re half the reason why I got into hacking and was successful is because, yeah, I'll sit and read the RFP. <laughs> RFC, excuse me. I'll sit and read the documentation. I will find a problem. I can read it faster than everybody else, and I can output it into a useful for everybody else form. Great question. Next. What's Twitter, handle again? Twitter handle is Securithid, or the more important one, besides STL. 
Anybody want to take a stab at why it's Securithid? I don't have anything to give away. But my cookie. You can give away a t-shirt. Okay, here. Next person that asks me a question that's actually useful gets a t-shirt. I get to determine useful. Or I'll keep it. This is a Splunk shirt. I only have like five of these. Actually, I don't have this specific one. So what's the best book you've read for social engineering? The best book I've read for social engineering. Okay, this is a two-part answer. Ed, do you have one of these? Nope. nope. Good. That's an awesome question. So there are so many good books on social engineering. Oh, my God. Uh, anything by Chris Agnetti, socialengineer.org. Uh, and that's kind of the giveaway, duh, answer. Um, I'm not going to say a certain famous hacker's books just because they are good books, but I don't think there's a lot of this is how it's done in there, which is a second throwaway answer. The actual one that taught me the most about social engineering that uh, I've used effectively is a book called The Wizard's First Rule. And it is a fantasy novel written by Terry Goodkind, the first of an incredibly, well, there you go. What's The Wizard's First Rule? You didn't read it enough. <laughs> People believe what they want to believe and, two parts to it, and what they're afraid to believe. Yeah. To me, that is the epitome of everything social engineering. If you can elicit an emotional response because somebody wants that response to happen or they're afraid of something, you have SE'd them. Works in email, works in person. It is the epitome of all of it. So you really don't have to read the book to get that. That's a good series. That's a good series. Uh, the first four books are a good series. The rest of them, eh, you got to really like Ayn Rand, and let's not even go into that. <laughs> so, good question. Anybody else? I still got five minutes. I will stare awkwardly. Is that human interface device? Nope. Good guess, though. Right. Think more nerdy, geeky. No, don't just do that. Is anybody playing the CTF? I highly recommend. It. Okay, you're the one that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah, keep people play the CTF. It's awesome. What else can we talk about? I guess I will give back my time. We can cut the last three minutes out of the recording, right? Just the awkward question and answer. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, thank you all. I will be around the rest of the day. Are we doing after party something? Is there a bar we should all hit? I don't have an official after party. But Is there a bar you and I are going to hit? Um, Springfield Yes. OK, so I am not buying drinks, but <laughs> I have way more fun stories to tell. You can definitely buy me one. I have even better stories for the people that, tell, that buy me beer. Uh, so yeah, let's, let, we will ha somehow we will say that at the end so that we will go to that bar and yes, I'll hang out. You got to have some kind of meetup. So, all right. Thank you guys. Thank the sponsors. Thank Beth. Uh,